Hello and welcome to another episode of CISO Tradecraft, the podcast that provides you with the information, knowledge, and wisdom to be a more effective cybersecurity leader. Today's episode is going to be great, but before we get started, let me share with you a word from our sponsor. Did you know the largest ransomware payment ever made was $40 million? Conventional ransomware defense doesn't address the real issue, open access to critical data. An employee can access 17 million files on day one. Veronis reduces your ransomware blast radius by showing you where your company's critical data is overexposed and automatically locking it down. Let Veronis test your ransomware readiness to see where you stack up. It's free, customizable, and non-intrusive. Visit veronis.com slash CISO Tradecraft. My name is G. Mark Hardy, and today we have Sunil Yu back again in our virtual studios to continue our discussion about his really cool book, Cyber Defense Matrix, The Essential Guide to Navigating the Cybersecurity Landscape. As always, follow us on LinkedIn and share with your friends where you hear us from so that we can go ahead and get more listeners and help more careers. Sunil, welcome back. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, this was. Yeah, we we originally were going to try to cover your book in a forty-five minute episode, and we realized we cut about halfway through. And after we, after we'd finished taping it, we we're like, that time went fast. Yes, it did, and, and it really did. But what we want to do is, is for those who just listened to it, if you're binge watching or binge watching, then binge listening, or if you heard it from last week, just kind of a quick walkthrough. So the cyber defense matrix just came out. Uh, it's twenty twenty two publishing day. Yeah, right? uh, February. February, yeah, it's a brand new. It, it was in preparation for a certain uh, conference that was supposed to happen in February. Imagine that, yeah, okay. But in any case, yeah, we can say it. Although they're not sponsors, although okay, if they if they sponsor us, we'll we'll mention those three letters. But in any case, first chapter we talked about how your matrix is put together. It's essentially identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. Our five functions with five asset classes, device, networks, applications, data, and users. And the advantage of that is it's kind of a unique type of a matrix in that it's a mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, meaning you should be able to find one spot for things if you work carefully and not more than one, which is really nice because now it's very distinct. And then over time, you'll find out as you move left to right, technology decreases, people increase, but there's always a need for process. We then took a look at the terminology, the idea of left and right of boom, where you identify and protect, and all that is kind of preparatory, and then boom, something bad happens. And then you get to the detect, respond, and recover part of the cyber defense, at which point we say, okay, these are the actions we're going to take. But a lot of questions with regard to how the cybersecurity framework was written, literally Sometimes the words are kind of sloppy, identify, detect, protect. And, and so a lot of what you do is clarify that and making sure we understand that. As we map these technologies and categories, we find out that we can use things such as the, uh, the use case for the detect side and the identify, protect, and recover. It's really the first order asset that's the subject. So it's not the tool itself, but what the tool is reporting on or, or managing. And then ultimately what we find out is we go to security measurements, we find out there's kind of an easy to hard way of doing things. Is the thing present? Okay, that's pretty easy. You can tell us it there. Is it, does it coverage what you're looking for? Is it being utilized effectively? Is it performing well? And ultimately, kind of the toughest thing is, is it efficient? And you had a nice vaccine analogy, which I loved, and it worked really well. And then finally in the chapter five, which we discussed in the last show, developing a security roadmap the analogy you had was being able to combine these five layers, almost like the first layer in your pantry. What's your current state? Do you actually have this tool or this capability in-house? And if so, in the little five by five matrix, put a blue dot in, the, in that box. And then as you find the recipe, what are your requirements? Do you know what it is? Those would be your red dots. And it turns out, although I think one was like a square and one was a dot, that the gap analysis is the overlay. So if you see that you have a lot of requirements, but no uh, blue dots, that is to say no capabilities, that tells me that we need to invest there. Or conversely, you might find out that we've over-invested in one particular area when there's not a whole lot of requirements. And then you could shade it based upon our MITRE attack framework to look at how dangerous this is. We could then look at the vendor market to see what tools are out there. And ultimately, if you have any constraints, we kind of call that like allergen avoidance. Uh, you'd shade it in black saying, for example, you're not allowed to do this, or you're operating in a certain environment that, that doesn't permit that. 
And so anything else you can think of that would help bring people back up to speed or should we jump right into where we left off? Yeah, one other uh, thing I would uh, mention is foundationally, the cyber defense matrix is an organizational framework. It helps you organize uh, very disparate things. And that's what um, uh, Mark you mentioned at the very end of the, the five different layers. So that's that's one. And then secondly, it, it's also really useful when it comes to pattern matching. And I think we'll talk about this a little later on too, but the cyber defense matrix and its structure allows us to do really rapid pattern matching and really rapid analogy creation in the sense that we see something happening in one domain we should naturally ask ourselves, shouldn't we be doing that same thing or same type of activity in a different domain? Mm -hmm. Excellent. And again, as we you had said before, and we'll reiterate reiterate toward the end here, as you get to your kind of your last four rules, that this is a strategic, not a tactical model. This is not what you would be doing on a minute to minute basis, managing the response, but this is how you would, if you will, arrange all of your assets well in advance so that you're effectively prepared for whatever happens to come our way. That's right. Okay, so we'll pick up on chapter six, which is situational awareness, and use Micah Ensley's definition as, quote, the perception of the elements in the environment within a volume of time and space, the comprehension of their meaning, and the projection of their status in the near future. Okay, so that's a dictionary definition. But for those who aren't trying to go ahead and uh, get the professor to give them a red check mark and say, that's great, what's situational awareness? What do we mean by that? Yeah, so uh, I go through, as I've done in other parts of the book, I go through and try to define things to be clear about what I'm characterizing here when I say the word situational awareness. So situational awareness is the, something that we all seek and we, we seem to uh, want more and more of it all the time. Um, but we, I, th I think it's important to recognize the, a distinction between situational awareness and what I call structural awareness, okay? So what is situational awareness? Well, situational awareness, in my view, is event and understanding of the events that occur on the right side of boom. Situational awareness that then is something that you want to establish starting with detect. And what we try to do is to understand, given these activities, given these events, is do I, do I actually have a fire in my house? Okay. Mm -hmm. Then there's structural awareness, and structural awareness is left of boom. And on the left of boom, what we want to do is to understand if there's a fire in my house, then what are the blueprints? What are the uh, where are the crown jewels? What are any hazardous or toxic materials? Was it was the building built to code? These are all things that are part of the structural awareness side of the equation. So situational awareness is on the uh, right of boom, structural awareness is on the left of boom. And then I also add this other perspective around, and this is this is on my own terminology, but uh, I try to also describe this notion of awareness outside of the asset of interest, okay? So if I have some alert that appears in my network, that's, what I want to do is get situational awareness of this event in the network. What I should then do is to understand the structural awareness of that network, okay? But the network doesn't live in isolation. It lives in the context of other types of assets, like your endpoints, your applications, your data, your users. And so I was trying to find a way to describe those other elements. And so I introduced two additional terms. And the terms are environmental awareness and, and contextual awareness. We oftentimes say, hey, do you, you want more context? Yes, yes, we do. But I was trying to have a distinguishing difference between left of boom and right of boom context. Okay, so just for the sake of having that distinction, I called it environmental awareness, which is on the left of boom, and contextual awareness on the right of boom. And the perspective here is that the things that surround the asset of interest is where we get the is where we want to get more environmental and contextual awareness. Okay. Anyway, it's it's a little bit hard to describe in, in words. Sometimes the picture literally is a you know, is worth a thousand words, but the the visual should hopefully help you understand how these various terms, structural awareness, situational awareness, environmental awareness, and contextual awareness all fit together. Yeah, page 81, if anybody's following along on their own copy, because hopefully they went ahead and ordered one last past week. 
But uh, yeah, so as you think about it then, and putting together situational awareness, we have kind of the typical stuff. We used to talk about things like uh, John Boyd's OODA loop, mm-hmm. observe, orient, decide, and act, which was developed back in the 1950s, mostly for fighter pilots. And they find out that if the your speed of going through your observe, orient, decide, act, your OODA loop, if you will, if you can operate faster than your opponent, chances are you're going to win the dogfight. That is to say, they, the opponent may make an adjustment and you can correct to it fairly quickly, but you make an adjustment and it takes them a little while to get there. And as a result, you slowly get closer and closer and then eventually you can win. And so from that perspective, the diagram I was talking about on page 81, where you have the five by five matrix, we see environmental awareness and structural awareness, as you said, left of boom. What is in my environment? How are things set up? How are they, you know, what are my devices? And and, how do they relate to one another? And how they relate to another. Exactly. Because if we don't think of the holistic approach, we can miss things. And we find an awful lot of time. That's really how attackers think. That's how you get lateral movement. Uh They don't just come in through the front door. And if you have a target and it's a hardened target, then a frontal assault is probably not going to work. But by being able to come in through the vendor uh, system, work your way sideways, eventually get into the payment card, and then exfil everything out through an FTP server or something like that. That's the way the game's played. Yeah. And, and oftentimes, when, when uh, as a defender, what you usually see is that last trace of something, and you're now, have to re- you're now having to reconstruct, well, what, what happened? So uh, the model that I offer in Chapter 6 is a way for threat hunters to systematically walk backwards and try to ascertain what might have happened in this particular event. Now, I, I used to run the hunt team in various capacities. And one of the things that we oftentimes ran into was a dead end. And, and we still run, to, run into that today in many cases and in, in many cyber investigations. So what I was trying to offer in chapter six of, of the book was to offer a, a, a template or a way that uh, defenders or specifically hunters could have a natural next step. Where else should I look? Where else could I look? And and the idea here is to say, okay, wherever you got the alert, whatever last step that uh, you saw where the attacker did something, that's usually where you have your first uh, bit of situational awareness. You're trying to get some situational awareness around this activity that uh, you first saw. And it could be some alert on an EDR or some network monitoring system or whatever. Well, whatever that is, usually you, you want to get, you get this uh, alert on the right side of Boom. The first thing you should do is to go to the left side of Boom for that asset class and say, tell me more about that. Tell me more about that particular asset. Now, again, it's going to not take you very far. You're going to run into a dead end pretty quickly. So the dead end is addressed by saying, well, look at some of these other asset classes. Is there, do you have environmental awareness of uh, the other asset classes that are related to the asset that is under question? Do you have contextual awareness of the activities of those other assets that are um, in relation to that other, to the asset that got compromised or whatever? And, And the answer is oftentimes, yes, we actually can take the next step by looking at these other types of assets and the activities that are borne out by those assets. So anyway, that's it's really just meant to be a really useful way to get unstuck. It, it is, because I think a lot of times we develop tunnel vision. We get one detect. We're like, I, I know this. It's like, this is Unix. I know Unix. And we, we go after it, but not realizing that most likely... If there, let's say, is a an intruder in our system, they didn't. That's not the first point of entry, unless we just happen to be very well instrumented and we get them right at the doorstep, and then we could just pour digital boiling oil on them and make them go away. But you you do point out something in there about the potential limitations or prob problems that could happen with situation awareness, and you mentioned three of them: the faulty visibility, faulty perception, and faulty comprehension. Let's talk about that really quickly. So that people understand that this is, there's always a little bit of the fog of war, as Clausewitz had had described when we're dealing with things. But faulty visibility, what do we mean by that? Yeah, so one of the things that we oftentimes, I hear all the time from other practitioners is, I need more visibility. 
<laughs> so my, actually my first argument to that is to say you probably have more visibility than you even know what to do with. And I walk people through this exercise where I show them a picture of some city landscape. And then I, I take that picture away and I say, well, what color was this mailbox? Or what color, what, what was the name of the store on this corner? And they're like, I, I don't know. Well, you had visibility. You saw it, right? I mean, no one questions that you had visibility. You just didn't have structural awareness. You didn't have, uh, you weren't consciously aware of these things. But anyway, that's it. That's that's not a flaw of visibility. That's actually a flaw of perception. Mm -hmm. Okay. The flaw of visibility is, well, I can't necessarily ask you what's behind you because you don't have literal eyes on your back. But generally speaking, we actually do have a lot of visibility in our environment. Nonetheless, there are going to certainly be places where we don't have visibility. And so that's where faulty visibility comes in. And then the yeah. faulty perception is what I just mentioned a moment ago. Mm -hmm. You You can see it, but you may not perceive what's important. And then lastly, the faulty comprehension, which says, I see it, I perceive it, but I'm, it's not computing. I'm not, I'm not making or drawing the right conclusions from that. Right. So I, again, I could ask you, uh, what color was the uh, mailbox in this corner? Um, that's the perception piece. The faulty comprehension piece is, did you realize there was a bomb in that mailbox? And uh, there, there may be telltale signals to indicate that, yes, there is a bomb. You know, you see a box next to the mailbox, and it's oily and has uh, wires sticking out. Okay, well, you, you see it, but you don't comprehend the, the significance of it. And so you miss the, the key important clues. Um, and over time, you know, that, that's just learned through experience as people understand, oh, yeah, I should probably pay attention to that because that's a, a huge danger, danger sign. And so that, that's an excellent insight there, because what happens is, is that a lot of people start out in cybersecurity, they might be putting a, either on a threat analysis team or being able to be a, a first level incident responder, but there's something that comes with experience. It's, uh, if you take a look in law enforcement, for example, uh, there's something that a 30 year professional who's been doing this, a retired cop, will spot things almost instinctively that a new person fresh out of the academy who's book smart, but not necessarily street smart. And so we do have a certain amount of street smarts that we need to have to be effective in this world. And so those, I think, are the good warnings for those people who think they know it all already. Yeah. So actually, there's, there's two aspects to this I want to uh, cover. So one is this notion of that training that you're talking about, where over time, the, the instinctual understanding that experience people have to look for something is that something that can be developed and it, it's uh, oftentimes also it's it's well codified in Malcolm Gladwell's blink around how how you can train yourself to be able to look for these things but I, at the same time that is actually a cognitive bias it, there's a flaw when that uh, there there are some flaws that appear when you operate solely in that way and the cyber defense matrix is also intended to be a counter to that flaw. The flaw is largely driven by what we call narrow framing. You you see a particular situation, you make a quick decision about that situation, and oftentimes 99% of the time that decision might be right, but there's a 1% of the time where that decision is actually the worst thing you could make. And it's you make that decision oftentimes only in this narrow framing context. Well, the cyber defense matrix gives you a broad framing view of the world. It it's, is almost by definition a broad framing view because it's saying, consider all these other types of assets and consider whether or not these assets are telling you something else that may not necessarily register or may be in conflict with that uh, instinctual blink-like decision that you might be making. And the, the example I give in the book is an insider threat use case where gee, it looks like this person is acting like an insider. Well, hold on. Uh, in a narrow framing context, yes, this user certainly looks like they're expelling all this information out to China or to Russia or whatever. But in the broad framing context, it's actually perfectly legitimate. And there's a perfectly legitimate business reason or context behind it. So that, so that broad framing context is something that the matrix is designed to help us think through. Right. And as you're saying that, the first thought that's come to mind is that, wait a minute, do I need to just stop and slow down my incident response, look at things? But then I go back to your earlier admonition. This is a strategic framework. This is not a tactical framework. By the time you're already in incident response mode, you should have done your homework. You should have this basic 
you know, your flashcards, if you will, prepared to say, okay, the shin bone's connected to the thigh bone, connected to here. I understand what these interdependencies are. I can go back and take a look at my environmental world as well as, you know, as I put together my my structural awareness and things such as that. Yes. So uh, let me retract or let me uh, counter one small thing. The cyber defense matrix, yes, it is a strategic view. So the use case I've, I just went through actually is one where it's seemingly more tactical because I'm telling you, well, a threat hunter in their tactical hunting activities could use the framework as a way to get unstuck. So there's an element of it being a tactical, you know, useful from a tactical standpoint. But the statement that you made earlier, which is that, that I made it earlier as well, which is that it, it is more of a strategic framework. What should happen from an engineering standpoint is to make sure that these resources, these this information about uh, your structural and environmental awareness and your uh, situational and, and contextual awareness, you should engineer to make that available to your threat hunters. You don't want your threat hunters in the midst of a fight having to figure out where do I get this additional awareness, right? They should have that at their fingertips and ready to go. Now, where they go with it is uh, is up to them. And again, I, I give uh, a template of that in the as an example in the book. But at, at a strategic level, from an engineering standpoint, we need to make sure that we have this awareness made available to to our uh, to our defenders. Uh, wh- one other quick general way I can also describe this in case people might have gotten lost. The number five is is really useful for a number of things. It, it describes the five functions of the NIST cybersecurity framework. It describes the five types of assets. It also describes the five senses of our body, right? Sight, sound, touch, uh, hearing, and smell, right? So that's right. So in some ways, that's what if we're trying to really understand what is this thing, okay? We we use all our senses to to make sense of the world. Likewise, in the cyber defense matrix, I'm saying, hey, use all our senses. Tell us what the endpoint's seeing. Tell us what the network's seeing. Tell us what the applications are seeing, and so on and so forth. Excellent. And so what we have then is the idea that as we go through and either you know, prepping the battlefield, facing some issues, that having that situational awareness, which ultimately comes from these multiple sources, looking across the different asset classes, allows us to probably increase our response correctness quite a bit because we're looking at things holistically instead of just a very narrow-minded, okay, this alarm went off over here. And in fact, it may be a distraction, a deliberate distraction, but we have ways to take a look at it from a holistic perspective and go, yeah, but that's not the whole game right there. Now, as we go forward and we'll kind of move on to the next chapter on seven and understanding security handoffs, what we talk about is that it's not going to be the same individual Who's or the same team or even the same sensor that's working at the identify level that works to protect or detect or respond or recover. And so as you look at these handoffs, why is this important? Why was this worth a whole chapter? Okay. So this particular chapter talks about the pattern matching that I mentioned uh, at the outset as well. So what's interesting about the cyber defense matrix is that it helps us reinforce or to validate certain patterns or anti-patterns that we see. And one of those patterns is uh, around handoffs, like what what different teams are supposed to do across the organization. And, and one of the handoffs that we oftentimes, of course, see is like between the business and security, or between IT and security, or between HR and security, or you know all these different uh, the different parts of the business uh, that operate. Well, it turns out as I was looking at different organizations and and where these handoffs are, I found places where the uh, alignment was inconsistent, and I, and if the model, if the cyber defense matrix is intended to represent something that forces consistency, or at least it's supposed to be internally consistent, then shouldn't then it, it pointed to potential flaws in our own thinking around who should do certain functions. So I talk about these four uh, initially. I talk about a couple of different functions that we perform in cybersecurity. Like one of the first ones being just inventory. All right. Well, so whose job is it to inventory? And we oftentimes within security end up holding the bag on inventory because, well, we kind of care about that. We, that's something that we care a lot about. But should we be the uh, entity that's responsible for, for gathering the inventory of those assets? And it turns out 
the answer is no, we shouldn't actually. And the way that validate that is to say, well, do we do we security inventory our data? Do we security inventory our users? Do we security inventory uh, the networks and the devices and our applications? And in some organizations, the answer may be yes, okay, because there is no other party that's willing to do it. But I would argue the the right answer should be no. Security shouldn't be doing it. That's the job of the owner. The owner should be doing that inventory. Let, let's take the next step, uh, which is like classification or prioritization. Again, what what business does security have in classifying or prioritizing some resource that some owner, some other, somebody else owns? We don't know. I mean, we can make a guess, but it's not our job to do that. But yet, in many organizations, I, I see security classifying data, and it's like, no, that's that's not your business. That should be the owner's job to do that. So anyway, um, the handoffs notion is uh, there are things that security is directly responsible for, and there are things that security is a beneficiary of. We oftentimes confuse us being the beneficiary uh, with being the owner or the responsible um, actor in performing that action. And the cyber defense matrix, or at least in chapter chapter seven, I, I was trying to lay a case for uh, how you can push back as a practitioner to say, no, this is actually not my job, uh, and let me explain why. And let me back that up with um, other examples where this is clearly not my job. It's a, it's the business owner's job or whatever. So why are you making me do this when uh, in all other cases, it's the owner that does it? And that's interesting uh, insight. I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a talisman where I take this thing to meetings with other people and I hit them over and said, let me sit, you know, slide this in front of you. But a, a reading according to Sunil is, <laughs> you know. And, but you make an excellent point, though, is that in security, there's an awful lot of things that we do that only we can do. And there's a lot of things that are necessary for us to mount an effective preparation and response, but are ideally the responsibility of others. But very often, people are happy to let someone else do their homework for them, Absolutely. if you will. And it's... Again, if you've got spare cycles in security and you got nothing better to do if, or fine, or you need to curry favor because it's the boss's son who runs that portion, he's usually playing golf and he'll never give you the inventory. But whatever it happens to be, there's, there's a better way uh, to do that. And I think this, this points it out in a very nice way. And so we talk about handoffs at the identify level and protect and go into some detail on that. But they notice that detect, respond, and recover all kind of fit into one page. And so as I was reading that, kind of the thought that I s struck is that in your model, the role for people increases as you go to the right. And yet it seems that the security handoffs decrease as you go to the right. Is that a symptom of more people on the problem? They don't have to hand off? Or is that uh, I'm getting tired and I, I want to wrap up the chapter? Not trying to say pejoratively <laughs> or anything like that, but I thought you could use a laugh. Uh, you know, uh, it could. I, I kind of recollect the time when I was writing this portion, and it certainly could have been a matter of I need to wrap up this chapter. I, I don't know if I, I can, I, the, you're bringing up an interesting um, interaction between the degree of dependency on people and just the how how short, the, how simple the handoffs seem to be in the, uh, on the right side. I, I think um, there, I think, I don't think that there's too much of a uh, I'm not sure how much you can you should read into that, but I think the observation you're making is probably correct in some respects. In that, because people are uh, we are because we are already heavily dependent upon people to uh, work together in detect, respond, recover. Maybe the handoffs are already implicitly understood. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure, but you're you're bringing up something that's worth probably further exploration. But generally speaking, I would say uh, when it comes to the detect function, that is that is security uh, largely doing that. When it comes to the respond function, it's a blend between security and uh, the owner, right? So I, I, security is, finds an insider. Uh, I'm not going to, and security is not going to uh, fire that insider. It, it has to be done in coordination with the manager and, and HR and various other people outside of the, outside of security. Security finds a, a compromised application. Obviously, the business is going to get involved before you shut down that application. So there's a there's a lot more interplay um, as you progress to the right, and especially when it gets to recover. 
a lot of that work is going to be done by the business, not by security. Okay, once once your house is safe, they're not going to go ahead and dry out your carpets and put the furniture back the way it belongs. And you know that's your job. That's right. Uh, you know they're, they're an, they came in there. Okay, you're safe. You're going to live, and your house is going to be here tomorrow. Now, it's not security, i.e., the fire department's responsibility to, to put everything back where it was. And and that's an important concept that sometimes people miss. And you need to be able, just like you had said earlier, in terms of some of these security handoffs, to know where to push off in a respectful manner to say, basically, not my job. It's your responsibility. And that's something that you need to do. So maybe that's a conversation that over time, security leaders can have with their fellow business leaders is to make sure that's well understood. Yeah. And, and the conversation should also be, well, what, what worked well and what didn't work well? Why did the fire occur to begin with? Right. Mm-hmm. So that, that conversation as an after action report is something that security certainly can and should be a part of. Whether security actually leads that is a different question. But um, as far as the handoff is concerned, yeah, recover is very much in the hands of the owner, not not security. Good. I, I think we concur on that. So the, the the next chapter in Chapter 8, Investing and Rationalizing Technologies Using the Cyber Defense Matrix. Probably the longest chapter title, but it could have just stopped at Investing and Rationalizing Technologies. But actually, probably one of the most interesting ones that I found is that you start out about exploring new use cases and then finding gaps out there in the marketplace. So can you walk us through a little bit of your thinking about how you're able to go ahead and and taking our five by five matrix and then overlaying not the other things that we saw before when we were taking a look earlier at the model that you had said, hey, this is great for a security roadmap and then having the pantry and the recipes, et cetera. But now it's a little bit different approach toward actually saying what's out there in terms of capabilities and where do they fit? Can you explain a little bit about how that works? Sure. Yeah. So it's this is th- this particular section is based on two key foundations. One is, again, the cyber defense matrix is an organizational system. So you find ways to organize different things that we do in security. And then uh, second is it's a pattern matching system. Okay, so let's take those two concepts together and and then what you get is what you see in chapter eight. The organizational system lets you take uh, various uh, types of things that we do in um, uh, endpoint security and organize them into the, the cyber defense matrix. But the pattern matching says, well, these things that we do for endpoint security, we there's a there's a parallel that we also do in application security. And there's a parallel that we do in network security and so on and so forth. So that parallel then makes it uh, more or less evident that uh, there may be gaps in our thinking around uh, the activities that we do. Okay, so let me, it's it's easiest if I just walk through an example. Um, I mentioned one of the first activities that we do is inventory, right? Okay, well, then I want a device inventory. I also want an application inventory. I want a network inventory. I want a data inventory. I want a user inventory. We may not call it a, uh, those words. It may be a data catalog or a user directory, but nonetheless, it's still an inventory, right? Okay, well, what happens next? So the next thing that usually happens, at least for data, is we do some sort of classification of that data, right? And let's call it prioritization. Well, where do we prioritize or classify uh, devices? Where do we classify? We actually, and I, I think we, I would argue we oftentimes don't beyond the broad classification of server or workstation, okay? What about for applications? Well, we have this classification of business critical. Okay, uh, so I could see that being one type of classification, but that's usually done by hand, by people manually classifying that or networks, we classify based on like internal versus external, okay? But is there a systematic way that we could discern that? With uh, users, we may classify based on roles or hierarchy or or whatnot. So these are the things that we do in the classification space. And what when you think about that, you're like, okay, I can see the pattern matching up- appearing, but I don't necessarily see the tooling to help us do that. So for example, I'll mention again, what helps us classify endpoints or well, workstations or devices? Is there any way I can quickly discern which of these are more important than others? And 
what we'll see is that most of the times it's done in a handcrafted fashion. And going back to the the structure of the matrix, at the bottom of the matrix, again, there's this dependency on people, process, and technology. And in the function of identify, I would argue that the bulk of this type of work should be done by technology. So I asked the question, what technology is helping us classify devices? And the answer is, there doesn't appear to be any. Okay. All right. Well, there's an opportunity then, right? There's a gap for which we are currently satisfying through manual means, but might we actually be able to find a technology that can help us do that? And then you kind of segue that into finding investment opportunities. And of course, you had spent the time at YL Ventures looking at startups and trying to identify those to say, you know, you guys want to move into a very crowded space that has well-entrenched uh, incumbents that are extremely well financed versus, as you had said, hey, nobody's doing this. And you kind of wonder because, you know, I've been like you in this business for a long, long time. And I think there's that famous quote from the head of the patent office sometime back in the 1800s. I could look up the details. It basically said everything that could be patented has been patented. And of course, we keep inventing, we keep coming up with new things. But the thing that made this chapter really fascinating for me, kind of twofold, one is finding investment opportunities, which said, hey, what's out there that might have a chance? And can you get involved early on as a mentor, as a board member uh, to, to kind of kick them up to the next level? But then the other thing is, is that for those who have an entrepreneurial bent, I say our first real interaction was when I did my startup uh, through Mach 37. It sounds like this is kind of a pretty good analysis to take a look at and say, you know what? That thing that I needed or that others need, it's just not there. And we're all doing it by hand. And we assume you have to do it by hand, but maybe there's maybe there's a, an app for that, so to speak. Uh, or there's an opportunity to create an app for that. Whether that's that app is commercially viable or not in the current time uh, is to be seen. But at least I can express that there exists a need. And oftentimes that need is usually fulfilled within an enterprise through handcrafted tools or, or really just manually. Um, but that, uh, but the, the, the framework allows us to quickly spot and say, yes, there exists that need. Should we go and build a company around it? The, the other thing that's also useful is that it also provides a template for how to meet that need. So you'll find what, what I found is that meeting that need or how you build capability to address that need follows a similar pattern as well. If if I discovered an interesting way to, I'll just go back to my example of classifying. If I found an interesting way to classify data, which we generally have, you know, using lots of technology, is the pattern for how we did that at the macro level a repeatable pattern? And what I mean by pattern here, I mean like things like to go to market, uh, uh, being able to identify who your buyer is, which, by the way, will be different buyers for different asset classes, but the patterns may be similar as it pertains to uh, how these companies uh, might have become successful. So that pattern matching the end, again, it becomes super useful in this regard where the patterns that we can perceive through the matrix may be extremely valuable for those who uh, are starting a new company or want to start a new company and want to either find a, pr a problem to solve and also know how they may go and tackle that problem. And you point out, I think, in your portfolio analysis section that you look at how close are other vendors, perhaps, in that space, and are they moving either horizontally or vertically throughout there? Because there might be something that could be, hey, nobody's covered this. But you don't realize that, hey, it's 1848, you're in California, and I think I found something shiny in a river. And before you know it, there's a stampede and you just get overrun. And so, again, really insightful for those, I think, for both portfolio management, as you'd said, in, in the YL Ventures experience, but also for those of us who are in the startup world. So that's that's great stuff. And that, as I said, that for me was the chapter that I thought was really personally interesting simply because you're looking at a much more macro view of the world there. And we, we had to understand these uh, vendor movements and such because, at least for Wild Ventures, there was a conflict of interest issues if we invested in two companies that basically were going to collide. 
But that, that problem that I, I faced at Wild Ventures is the same problem that we as practitioners face when it comes to do I buy overlapping technologies? And we won't necessarily have budget for every technology out there. At some point, they will overlap. How can you anticipate what those overlaps are and plan accordingly? Mm -hmm. And that, that's a great strategic viewpoint. As we get into the last couple of chapters, dealing with the latest security buzzwords and our conclusion, uh, you, you point out some interesting things from the jargon like zero trust or secure access service edge. And I don't know if we need to, to dive down deeply into any of these kind of buzzwords things, but in general, you thought it was worth addressing. So what can we do in terms of applying the, the concept of the matrix in our interactive system here with looking at whatever is the buzzword of the week, so to speak? Yeah. And... There's no end to all the buzzwords. I think it, this this was actually one of the harder chapters to write because I'm trying to dissect these buzzwords into something that's actually meaningful and, and can be described through the lens of the cyber defense matrix. And it it honestly, is, it was really, really hard, but I think the exercise itself was very fruitful because it helped me refine my own thinking about what the matrix is able to do and what it's not able to do. But also, like, what do these terms really mean, like zero trust or secure access service edge or CSPM or SPM, you know, like security posture management? Like, what do we mean by security posture? Set Can up straight. Be... Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and the analogies are actually super useful because you can say standing up straight is not something else. It's not somebody coming in to tell you what you should be eating. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's posture and, and healthy eating are two different things. So just understanding the terms and to understand um, what how they're distinct is what that exercise about dealing with the security buzzwords was all about. I, w whether or not I got it right is uh, is debatable, and I'm always uh, willing to have my main, mind changed. I reserve the right to change my mind. And uh, as people come in and say, well, no, I think you got this wrong, I, I'm, I, I'm, I have no doubt that I got certain things wrong here. So happy to get feedback on what uh, they think is the right mapping. And that's one of the things we love to do with the podcast is encourage our listeners, you know, give us some feedback. Are we on target? Are we off target? And if we're off target, don't just tune us out. Like, let us know. Give a little, you know, hey, what about this? Or have you thought about this? Because I think in doing so, it gets others involved in the discussion because no one of us knows all of it. Uh, security is just far too big now, but we can gain insights and in, in different ways of looking at things. And again, one of the dangers, if you will, in the buzzword world, as we talked about uh, briefly in the first episode, has to do with Gartner Group classifying companies, vendors, products into these different buckets, so to speak, for their magic quadrant analysis. And although some vendors say, hey, wait a minute, I'm not really one of these, I'm one of those, they kind of kind of get dragged along and that's part of how their public persona is, and you don't get much choice about it. It's just the way the world is going to go ahead and describe you. So as we wrap up here, uh, in the conclusion, you kind of really offer four tips and uh, for making the tool useful. And on 131, I'm thinking the first one, adhere to the principle, stick something in one box and only one box is a forcing function. And that's a discipline that at first was tough. And mm -hmm. as I said, the first time I went through the book and tried to understand it, when we were back up there in chapter three on mapping security technologies and categories, I had to reread some of that over and over again until I finally could say, yes, this does fit here. It's a little bit like the early CISSP exams where they say, you know, indicate the best, best. answer. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're all correct, but one of them's better than the others and you need to go ahead and get that. And so that function there helps people to ensure that the matrix remains useful. And the second rule you said was no new rows or columns. Don't make it a six by five or uh, a nine by two by 17 or something like that. Uh, although that's how other books get written and that's how other ideas come out. Someone improves on a, an existing model, but the utility of this, I think really comes back to what you had originally described is how this model is put together is that it is a mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive matrix or M-E-C-E, however the right way to pronounce that. M-E-C. Yeah. M-E-C. Okay, great. And, uh, but that keeps it there. Number three, be careful about new dimensions because we don't think very well in 
you know, four and five dimensions. Although on my bookshelf behind me, if you look carefully, and maybe I'll show it over the side, is a Clifford Stoll Klein bottle. When a few years ago, my wife, you know, I'll show what it is. It's basically a non orientable surface in three dimensions. And it's a pretty cool toy. For those who know what I'm talking about, great. Otherwise, you can look it up. And the last one's Remain Strategic. And we mentioned that a little bit earlier. Uh, but it, uh, it's it's a great book. As I, I really encourage CISOs and security leaders to invest in it and take the time to read it. If I say take the time, I mean, it's not casual reading. Don't have the TV on and you're playing with the kids and, oh, you're going to try to catch this while you catch up on email. It's really worth the focus time because there's some profound insight in here which I have not seen in other places before. There's other places of profound insight, but as I had mentioned earlier, there's no fluff in here. This is great, and it is a constant created dose of information and knowledge and wisdom, which is what we say our show is all about. So, and, and I, Thank you for the kind words. One other thing I would say, I, I think I might have mentioned in the conclusion, but the, the, one of the main motivators for writing the book was because of that quote that I mentioned last time, which was all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I believe I have found some degree of utility in this model. I invite others. The reason why I wrote the book is because I invite others to offer new use cases that they discover. And I would love to hear about those use cases. So uh, I had thought about, well, my when I first started writing this book, it was going to be like 20 chapters. As you know, it's only 10 chapters, uh, and it's a fairly short book, which which uh, was hard in and, of it, in and of itself. And as soon as I finished publishing this, of course, the next question was, well, when are you going to publish the next, the next volume or whatever? I'm like, I, I'm not really interested in doing that, but I'm very much interested in having other people contribute to essentially their own use case or their own chapter based on something that they created. And that's something that I'm actually, that, that I did at RSA when uh, I actually hold the workshops where I invite other practitioners to come and uh, present with me on their use cases. And I love that because it's not my use case. It's something that where they found utility in something and said, hey, world, this is uh, a useful way to use the matrix. So anyway, um, that's what I, I hope to do. And as far as the next steps for the book, that's, you know, if there's a volume two, it would be largely other people's use cases. And maybe at some point in the future, if I have enough energy and time and coordination, uh, we'll have some conference or user group where we can go and, and design these together. That sounds great. Well, Sunil, thank you very much for your time. For everybody, it's a cyber defense matrix, the essential guide to navigating the cybersecurity landscape. There will be a link in our show notes, so you can go ahead and get your own copy, which I really encourage you to do. So for everybody out there, thank you for listening. This is G. Mark Hardy, your host, and we encourage you to ensure that you're following us, subscribe to CISO Tradecraft Podcast. And until next time, stay safe.